Hi, I'm Pastor Corey, and you're listening to the Orange United Methodist Sermon Podcast. We're a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that wants to help you find your place in God's story. And we hope this sermon can guide you along that path. Visit orangemethodist.org to find out more information about location, service times, upcoming events, and ways to give. We hope you enjoy. Good morning, church. Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, verse, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, and it reads, Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you again, Savannah. Good morning. My name is Brad Inman, and I am the associate pastor of youth and congregational life here at Orange, and I am so happy to be present here with you this morning. It's now been seven years since I packed up and I moved to Chapel Hill. Some of you know this, but I moved here just for this job here at Orange. I grew up in Ohio, uh, went to school there. My first job was just an hour away from home in Michigan, but it was time for a new job, and I was really open to anywhere as long as it was a good fit. And I thought Orange was a good fit, and luckily you guys did too, and I think, you know, we got it right. Uh, But really, I was super excited to move here. I was excited about my new job. I was excited about this town and its restaurants and all the things to do. It was nice to be around other young professionals. One of my best friends from undergrad uh, was getting his PhD at UNC. Really, my only reservation about moving here was that it was going to be so far from my family, about a 10-hour drive. Um, SPRC assured me that I was going to be able to travel home for the holidays, and they could be flexible about vacations and things like that so that I could do it. But I was still going to be missing out on that between-holiday time. And I'd really be missing out on watching my niece and nephew grow up, who were seven and six at the time, who I was really close to and just so much fun, such fun ages uh, to have to miss out on. I've since actually added two more nephews to the family, both during youth trips, which is kind of fun. But I was really going to miss my family, and I was especially going to miss watching my oldest nephew, Monty, grow up. Monty and I have always had this special connection. I don't know what it is, but we just really understand each other at this deep level. Uh, We don't have to really talk or share our feelings. We just kind of look at each other, and we know. It's weird, but it's great. (laughs) But I love him, and he loves me, and leaving town when he was seven years old was really tough. Um, His dad wasn't the greatest role model, and right now he's not really in the picture at all, and I just wanted to be that male presence in Monty's life that he could count on. So I tried from a distance. Um, You know, I tried to be present in his life. I tried to call him on the phone, but I hate talking on the phone, and he's seven. Not going to work. So I tried other ways to be present. Uh, Right before I moved to North Carolina, I started reading Harry Potter to him because I love Harry Potter, and he was just getting excited about reading, so I wanted to share that passion with him. I was so excited to share that. But we got like two chapters into the first book before I ended up moving. So that year for Christmas, I gave Monty that first book and a pack of CDs for months leading up to Christmas. At night, I would get out my book and open my laptop, and I would record myself reading the book. I basically made a Uncle Brad version uh, audio book of the first Harry Potter book. I did it for the next one as well. Um, He didn't get book three because those chapters are really long. And also, I met this girl named Elin who started taking up all my time. Um, I think those audio books were awesome, if I do say so myself. 
but they really weren't enough either. I tried so many things, but I just couldn't be as present in his life as I wanted to be. So instead of just trying new things, I decided that I would make sure that every time I was home, I would be 100% mentally present. I wouldn't go off and do my own thing. I wouldn't be on my phone. I was there. But there was another great opportunity to be present. Um, Every year since Monty was four years old, my dad and I have taken him to northern Michigan to go skiing on the same mountain where I learned to ski. The holidays were a great time to be present, but the boys' ski, the boys' ski trip, which is what we call it, you got to spell it with a Z, the boys' ski trip, that was something special. Two on one time for Monty, just him, his papa, and his uncle Brad. And it wasn't just special for him. It's really special for me, too, because we were just with one another. From the long car ride to sitting next to one another on the chairlift, drinking hot chocolate in a warming hut, eating dinner, finally watching the Mighty Ducks as he cuddled up near me and fell asleep within the first 15 minutes. There's just so something about that time that was so precious. I know it's how precious it is to Monty, because there's one more tradition that happens every year that goes alongside with the boys' ski trip. Monday morning, we wake up, we pack up the van, and we've got a five-hour ride to the Detroit airport where they drop me off, and then they finish the last uh, hour drive home. And we'll get in the car, and Monty will be kind of oddly quiet. And then another hour passes by, and he's somehow even quieter. About an hour from the airport, he'll start to complain that his tummy hurts. And finally, we'll get to the airport, and he'll give me a big hug. He'll kind of struggle to get out his goodbye. And then about a few hours later, when I get back to RDU, I'll call my dad and let him know that I got home safely, and I'll also say, you know, how's Monty doing? I'll be like, he's fine. As soon as you left, the tummy ache went away. He just really was upset about you having to leave. Sometimes there are tears after I leave, sometimes there aren't, but once I leave, that stomach ache goes away. It's just that the thought of me leaving tears him up inside. It's adorably pathetic, (laughs) but it tells us two things. Absence from those we love tears us up inside, but presence with those we love is life-giving, and there's no real substitute for presence. Today, we continue our examination of our baptism vows. As we we become a part of God's family, we receive so many blessings, but we also vow to do our part as members of God's family. We promise God and one another that we will love our family by making sacrifices. We'll give of our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. We'll give for the betterment of our family and for our family's mission. And the fantastic thing is that we were all created to be a part of this family. So when we're in it, when we're contributing, when we're active, when we're doing our part, there is no greater sense of fulfillment, peace, and joy. Today, we're going to focus on that presence. We're going to explore what it means to be present, who to be present with, and how it benefits our church family. Our passage from Hebrews uh, that Savannah just read for us is a great one. And it says that there are two ways that we need to be present. And the first is to be present with God. Hebrews is one of my favorite books because of how deep and rich its theological imagery can be. And this passage is no exception. Kind of rudely oversummarized, it says, Because you can enter the most holy place due to the blood of Jesus, you darn well better enter that most holy place. In the Old Testament, the most holy place was the temple, inside the temple, inside the temple. Only the high priest could enter it, and only once a year with special clothes and special offerings and enough incense burning that the smoke would shield him from the face of God. I actually wrote an entire sermon about this a few years ago because of how important the symbolism of this is. But suffice it to say that the most holy place is the place where heaven and earth meet. It's where God resides. 
In the Old Testament, if anyone but the high priest entered, or if the high priest entered but hadn't properly completed all the protocols for entering, he would be killed immediately, not by God, but by the sin within him as he encountered the fullness of God's glory. But now, because of the blood of Jesus that makes us cleaner than any amount of incense, sacrifices, fancy clothes, or good deeds that ever have or ever will exist, we can enter that most holy place. We can be in the place where heaven and earth meet. We can be in God's presence. I am no high priest. My doves and goats, they have all escaped I have no sacrifices, and incense gives me a terrible headache. More importantly, I'm still a sinner who messes up. I should not be allowed in God's presence. But because Jesus sacrificed himself for me, none of that matters. I can be in the most holy place. I can be present with God. And so can you. So why don't we? What keeps us? Because you can enter the most holy place due to the blood of Jesus, you darn well better enter that most holy place. It sounds kind of mean, but it's true. We have the ability to be in God's presence in a way that would have been unthinkable to God's family in the Old Testament. Not only that, but throughout Scripture, God promises us that he is always with us. And in the New Testament, he promises us that the Holy Spirit lives inside us. So we have unprecedented, unimaginable access to the God of the universe who loved us enough to die for us and wants only for us to receive that love and love him back. And yet, how often are we truly, fully, 100% present with him? Clearly, this is something that many of us struggle with. The fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Then Jesus tells us that the Sabbath was made for humans. God knew that even when we could be present with him, whenever we wanted, we would need that reminder that it is important to set aside the busyness of the rest of the world and to rest and to be present with him. Even with a global pandemic screeching our world to a halt, how many of us have found excuses not to be present? With God. God longs for that time. He is Monty counting down the days to the boys' ski trip, packing his suitcase two months in advance. Monty doesn't care about snow conditions. He doesn't critique the hotel room. He doesn't worry about restaurant reservations. He's there with his Uncle Brad and his Papa. Nothing else matters. God doesn't care about the floweriness of your prayers, the notes you sing off key, or the novelty of your insight into scripture. He just wants you present there with him. And we need it too. Not only do you need it and God desires it, but your church family needs it. Your life was never meant to be lived alone, but with your family. An absence from our family can tear us up inside. If there's nothing else we've learned during this pandemic, it's that presence matters and that there's no full substitute for physical presence. Virtual sermons and talent shows and heartfelt devotionals are nice, good things. And so are homemade Harry Potter audiobooks. But those things are not sharing meals, singing, or just sitting next to one another in the quiet. I thank God that there is still mystery in the simplicity. That as smart as we get as humans, we remain unable to articulate the ethereal importance of something as simple as being near one another. I've Zoomed, I've texted, I've emailed, I've called so many of you during this pandemic. But when I've had the opportunity to see smiling eyes behind a mask in person, the warmth and flood of affection that I feel is simply unmatched. It's like a family member coming home for the holidays. A Christmas card and a phone call just isn't enough. I need a smile. I need a hug. I need to just be present with my family. Your presence matters to your church family. 
Our passage from Hebrews tells us that we need to be present with God, but the second part of that passage tells us that we must not stop meeting with one another. We definitely can't let it become a habit. We have to come together, and when we do, we encourage one another. We push one another on to good deeds and to love, and most importantly, we help one another love better. We meet in the presence of God, and God rubs off on us, and we rub off on each other, and iron sharpens iron. When we're together, we're better. As individuals and as a family, we better live out our family purpose, helping people find their place in God's story, in God's family, the community, and the world. We help people find where they belong. We help them feel connected, present to God and to one another. In many ways, being present is an act of love. When I was in high school, I was a swimmer. I grew up swimming in our town's little outdoor league, and I was pretty good, but I took a few years off in middle school. And when I jumped into the pool for my first high school practice, I quickly discovered that I was out of my league. I was clearly and decidedly the worst swimmer on the team, but I loved it. I loved it so much. I love my teammates. I love the practices. The harder, the better. I love the swim meets, just everything about it. Swimming really defined my high school years in a lot of ways. And because it meant so much to me, and I worked so hard at it by my senior year, I was actually pretty good. <laughs> I wasn't going to make states or anything like that, but I had been voted team captain, and I made it to districts in both of my individual events. I was so proud of the progress that I had made. I had dumped literal minutes from my times from freshman year, and those four years of dedication were going to display themselves at that district meet. I'd worked hard for myself, but also for my team, and I was so excited that I finally had the chance to score points to help them place higher than they ever had at the district meet. I was so excited, and I was so focused that meet was going to be the culmination of four years of dedication and hard work. But my parents couldn't be there. They had planned a uh, vacation years in advance. I didn't blame them in the slightest, and truthfully, I didn't really care. I was laser-focused. All I cared about was that pool and those races. So there I am, the day of districts. I've shaved my head, my arms and legs, the whole deal. I'm wearing the cool swim pants that look like, or swim trunks that look like pants go all the way to your ankles. I was Michael Phelps out there. No, I was not Michael Phelps, but I look cool. <laughs> I'd led my team in the cheers. We had stretched. We had warmed up. And I walk over behind the blocks to get ready for my first race. And I am just hyped, but calm and focused. I'm shaking with anticipation and energy. And I hear from the balcony stands right behind me, hey, Brad, good luck. I looked up, and it was my sister, Liz. She had driven early that morning from Indiana as a surprise. Liz knew that my parents were out of town, obviously, and she knew that our other sister was kind of off the grid at this point, and she wasn't going to be able to make it. She knew that no one from our family was going to be there for me, but what a huge deal that district meet was to me. Even though I didn't think it was that big of a deal at the time, Liz knew that presence mattered. In that moment, it still really didn't mean that much to me. I was like, oh, that's nice. Liz came. Race. I was focused on that race. But now looking back, that's one of the clearest memories of those days. It's not the race, it's not the trophy presentation or the team pictures. It's remembering that Liz showed up there for me. It's that act of love that I remember every time I look back on that day. We were family, and I was doing something that was really important to me, and Liz just wanted to be there. She wanted to share it with me. She wanted to be present. Our vows of prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness are vows for a reason. They're significant acts of love. They show sacrifice. They show that we're part of the family. They show that we buy in with all we've got. You can't do it without showing up for one another and showing up for God. 
Sometimes we can't be present in the way that we want. I can't drive home every weekend to see my family, and right now the best way that we can love one another is to try to be present from a distance. But we can all text, call, and email. We can remind one another that even though we are apart, the love remains. We can encourage one another. We can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Homemade audiobooks are better than nothing at all. So this week, I want you to reach out to someone. I want you to think of a church member who you miss being present with. And I want you to do something to remind them that even though you are not present physically, that love and encouragement remains, that you are still family. Make that phone call, write a letter, make a fun little care package and put it on their front porch as a surprise. Whatever it is, let them know that you miss being present with them. And when we can be physically present together again, make it a priority. Don't make it a habit not to meet. We need you. You are part of the family, and it's not the same without you. We are better together. We're better together because we also push one another closer to God. He loved us enough to bring us to the place where heaven meets earth. Meet him there. Not out of obligation or guilt or preoccupation with the swirling chaos of your life around you, but in the stillness, fully, completely present. A lot of the times, that's all we need. In our tradition service, each service begins with the acolytes coming forward, bringing forward a flame and lighting candles to remind us that God is present with us in worship. This week, I also want you to find some time to be present with God. And when you do, I want you to light a candle. You've all got a candle. Come on. Go find a candle, light it. Have it be a reminder that God is present with you and be there present with him. Maybe you got to wake up early to do it. That's not me. That's not going to work. I may have to light the candle before I get in the shower and focus that time on being present with God. Or maybe I light a candle while I do the dishes, and instead of listening to a podcast, I'll have a conversation with God. It doesn't matter what you do with that time. It matters that you're present with your God. So this week, I want you to write a letter and to light a candle. I want you to renew your baptism promise to be present, to be present with God and to be present with one another. Because you can enter the most holy place due to the blood of Jesus, you darn well better enter that most holy place. And when a group of people meeting with God then meet together, the family gets stronger. The love transforms and grows, and people find the place where they can be present. Be present with God, and be present with your church family this week. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this Sabbath, this break, this opportunity to be still and to be silent. We thank you for your presence with us here today. We pray that you would help us calm ourselves, to empty ourselves of all the other stuff, and just be present with you. We thank you for our church family, God. We thank you that even though we cannot be physically present right now, we know that that love remains. We know that spiritually we are present with one another, and you are the one who unites us, God. We pray that you would put those people from our family in our minds, the ones who we need to reach out to, the ones who we miss, the ones who miss that presence and need to be reminded that they're part of a family and they're loved. We pray that you give us the courage to reach out to those people, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us again next week. In the meantime, you can find us online at orangemethodist.org.